The Kingdom by the Sea by Robert Westall Read by Kevin Waitley Chapter 1 He was an old hand at air raids now. As the yell of the siren climbed the sky, he came smoothly out of his dreams, not scared. Only his stomach clamped down tight for action, as his hands found his clothes laid ready in the dark. Hauled one jumper, then another over his pyjamas, thrust both stocking feet together through his trousers and into his shoes, then bent to tie his laces thoroughly. A loose lace had tripped him once, in the race to the shelter. He remembered the smashing blow as the ground hit his chin, the painful week after not able to eat with a bitten tongue. He grabbed his school raincoat off the door, pulling the door wide at the same time. All done by feel, no need to put the lights on, lights were dangerous. He passed Dulcie's door, heard Mam and Dulcie muttering to each other, Dulcie sleepy and cross, Mam sharp and urgent. Then he thundered downstairs, the crack of light from the kitchen door lighting up the edge of each stair tread. Dad was sitting in his warden's uniform, hauling on his big black boots, his grey hair standing up vertically in a bunch like a coxcomb. Without looking up, Dad said, Bloody Hitler, four bloody nights in a row. There was a strong smell of Dad's sweaty feet, and the fag he had burning in the ashtray. That was all Harry had time to notice. He had his own job. The two objects laid ready in the chair by the door. The big roll of blankets wrapped in a ground sheet because the shelter was damp, done up with a big leather strap of Dad's, and Mam's precious attaché case with the flask of hot coffee and insurance policies and other important things, and the little bottle of brandy for emergencies. He heaved the blankets onto his back, picked up the case in one hand and reached to unlock the back door with the other. Mind that light, said Dad automatically. But Harry's hand was already reaching for the switch. He'd done it all a hundred times before. He slammed the door behind him, held his breath and listened. A single aircraft's engines far out to sea. A jerry. But nothing to worry about yet. Two guns fired one after another. Two brilliant points of white lighting up a black landscape of greenhouse, sweet pea trellises and cucumber frames. A rolling carpet of echoes. Still out to sea. Safe then. He ran down the long back garden with his neck prickling and the blankets bouncing against his back comfortingly. As he passed the greenhouse, the rabbits thumped their heels in alarm. There was a nice cold smell of dew and cabbages. Then he was in through the sheltered door, shoving the damp, mould-stinking curtain aside. He tossed the things onto Mam's bunk, found the tiny oil lamp on the back girder and lit it, and watched the flame grow. Then he lit the candle under the pottery milk cooler that kept the shelter warm. Then he undid the bundle and laid out the blankets on the right bunks, and turned back to the shelter door, ready to take Dulcie from Mam. He should be hearing their footsteps any second now. The patter of Mam's shoes and the crunch of Dad's hobnail boots. Dad always saw them safe in the shelter before he went on duty. Mam would be nagging Dad. Had he locked the back door against burglars? They always teased Mam about that. She must think burglars were bloody brave, burgling in the middle of air raids. God, Mam and Dad were taking their time tonight. What was keeping them? That jerry was getting closer. More guns were firing now. The garden, every detail of it, the bird bath and the concrete rabbit flashed black, white, black, white, black. There was a whispering in the air. Gun shrapnel falling like rain. They shouldn't be out in that. Where were they? Where were they? Why weren't they tumbling through the shelter door, panting and laughing to be safe? That jerry was right overhead. <laughs> and then the other whistling, rising to a scream. Bombs! Harry began to count. If you were still counting at ten, the bombs had missed you. The last thing he remembered was saying, seven. His back hurt and his neck hurt. His hands scrabbled and scrabbled damp clay that got under his fingernails. The smell told him he was still in the shelter, but lying on the damp floor. And a cautious, fearful voice with a slight tremble in it was calling out, Is anybody down there? Somebody pushed the curtain across the shelter door aside and shone a torch on him. The person was wearing a warden's helmet, the white W glimmering in the light of the torch. He thought at first it might be Dad, but it wasn't Dad. It had a big black moustache. It was a total stranger. 
the stranger said to somebody else behind him. There's only one of them, a kid. Jesus Christ, said somebody else. Ask him where the rest are. There should be four in this shelter. Where's the rest, son? Where's your mom and dad? In the... I don't know. You mean still in the house, son? The voice behind muttered, Christ, I hate this job. Then it said with a sharp squeak of fear, What's that? What's what? Something soft under me foot, shiny light? It's only a rabbit. Dead rabbit. Oh, thank God. Hey, son, can you hear me? Can you get up? Are you hurt? Why didn't the man come down and help him? What was he so frightened of? Harry got up slowly. He hurt nearly all over, but not so badly that he couldn't move. The man gave him a hand and pulled him up out of the shelter. Harry peered up the garden. He could see quite well because the sky to the west was glowing pink. There was no greenhouse left. There was no house left. The houses to each side were still standing, though their windows had gone and their slates were off. Where's our house? There was a silence. Then the man with the moustache said, Was your name, son? Harry told him. And what was your dad's name? And your mum's? He wrote it all down in a notebook like the police did when they caught you scrumping apples. He gave them Dulcie's name too. He tried to be helpful. Then he said, Where are they? And began to run up the garden path. The man grabbed him quick and rough. You cannot go up there, son. There's a gas leak. A bad gas leak. Pipes fractured. It's dangerous. It's against the law to gun up there. But me mum and dad's up there. Nobody's up there now, son. Come down to the rest centre. They'll tell you all about it at the rest centre. Harry just let himself be led off across some more gardens. It was easy because all the fences were blown flat. They went up the path of number five. The white faces of the Humphreys who lived at number five peered palely from the door of their shelter. They let him pass without saying anything to him. In the road, the wardens who were leading him met two other wardens. And you look at number nine? Oh, just this lad. There was a long, long silence. Then one of the other wardens said, We found the family from number seven. They were in the garden. The bomb caught them as they were running for the shelter. They all right? Broken arms and legs, I think. But they'll live. Got them away in the ambulance. Harry frowned. The Simpsons lived at number seven. There was some fact he should be able to remember about the Simpsons, but he couldn't. It was all mixed up. Come on, son. Rest centre for you. Can you walk that far? Harry walked. He felt like screaming at them, only that wouldn't be a very British thing to do. But something kept building up inside him, like the pressure in his model steam engine. Where was his steam engine? Where was Mam, who could cuddle him and make everything all right? Where was Dad in his warden's uniform who could sort everything out? Next second, he'd broken from the hands and was running up another garden path like a terrified rabbit. He went through another gate, over the top of another air raid shelter, through a hedge that scratched him horribly, on and on and on. He heard their voices calling him as he crouched in hiding. They seemed to call a long time. Then one of them said, Well, that wasn't very clever. That's the shock. Shock takes some funny ways. You can never tell how shock's going to take him. I hope he's not seriously hurt, poor little bleeder. Kid that can run like that. And then the voices went away, leaving him alone. So he came to his house, slowly up his garden. He found his three rabbits. They were all dead, though there wasn't a mark on them. Where the greenhouse had been was a tangle of wrecked tomato plants that bled green and gave off an overpowering smell of tomato. The house was just a pile of bricks. Not a very high pile because everything had fallen down into the old cellar. There was a smell of gas, but the gas was burning seeping up through the bricks and burning in little blue points of flame, all in the cracks between the bricks. It looked like a burning slag heap, and he knew why the wardens had given up hope and gone away. He knew he must go away too, before anybody else found him, began to ask him questions and do things to him, because he felt like a bomb himself, and if anyone did anything to him, he would explode into a million pieces, and nobody would ever be able to put him back together again. Especially, he mustn't be given to Cousin Elsie. 
cousin Elsie, who would clutch his head to her enormous bosom and sob and call him poor Ben and tell everybody who came all about it over and over and over again. He'd seen her do that when cousin Tommy died of diphtheria. Cousin Elsie was more awful than death itself. No, he would go away, where nobody knew him, where nobody would make a fuss. Just quietly go away. Having made his mind up, he felt able to keep moving. There were useful things to do. The blankets in the shelter to bundle up and take with him. The attaché case, all proper as mum and dad would have wanted it. It seemed to take him a long time to get the blankets bundled up exactly right and as he wanted them. In the faint light before dawn, he even managed to find dad's spade and bury his three rabbits. They had been his friends. He didn't want anybody finding them and making a meal of them. He even found some wooden seed markers and wrote the rabbits' names on them and stuck them in for tombstones. Then he went, cutting across the long stretch of gardens and out into Brimble Road where hardly anybody knew him. He looked dirty, tear-stained and exactly like a refugee. His face was so still and empty. Nobody, even Cousin Elsie, would have recognised him. He felt... He felt like a bird flying very high, far from the world, and getting further away all the time. Like those gulls who saw on summer thermals, and then find they cannot get down to earth again, but must wait till the sun sets and the land cools, and the terrible strength of the upward thermal releases them to land, exhausted. Only he could not imagine ever coming to earth again, ever. Back to where everything was just as it always had been, and he did things without thinking about them. He supposed he would just walk until he died. It seemed the most sensible thing to do. Chapter 2 He must have wandered around the town all day, in circles. Every so often he would come to himself and realise he was in Rudyard Street or Nile Street. But what did Rudyard Street mean? What did Nile Street mean? Sometimes he thought he would go home and Dulcie would be swinging on the front gate, shouting rude things at the big boys as they passed, but running to the safety of Mam's kitchen if they made a move to attack her. And Mam would be doing the ironing or putting the stew in the oven. But the moment he turned his steps towards home, the truth came back to him. The burning pile of bricks. And he would turn his steps away again. The last time he came to himself, he was somewhere quite different. On the beach. The little beach, inside the harbour mouth that didn't have to be fenced off with barbed wire because it was under the direct protection of the castle guns. He suddenly felt very tired and sat down with a thump on the sand with his back against a black tarry boat. He closed his eyes and laid back his head. The warmth of the sun smoothed out his face like Mam had often done with her hands. He smelt the tar of the boat and it was a nice smell. It was the first thing he'd smelt since the burning gas and it was a comforting smell. The sun warmed his hands as they lay on the sand, and his knees under his trousers, and in a very tiny world it was nice, nice, nice. It felt as if somebody cared about him, and was looking after him. On the edge of sleep he said, Ma'am? Questioningly. And then he was asleep. He dreamed it was just a usual day at home, with Dulcie nagging on and Mam begging, and Dad coming in from work and taking his boots off with a satisfied sigh. He dreamed he shouted at them, There you all are, where you been? And they all laughed at him and said, Hiding, silly! And it was all right. The all rightness stayed with him when he woke, a feeling that they were not far away. He lay relaxed as he remembered lying relaxed in his pram when he was little, and watching the leaves of trees blowing, whispering, and sunlit overhead. As long as he didn't move, he knew the bubble of happiness would not break. But if he moved, he knew they would go away and leave him again. So he lay on, dreamily. The sun still shone, though it was setting and the shadows of the cliffs were creeping out towards him. And that, he knew, was bad. When the shadow reached him, the sun would be gone. The world would turn grey. A cold breeze would blow. And it would be time to go home. Like the three girl bathers who were walking up the beach towards him, chattering and laughing and feebly hitting each other with wet towels. They had a home. He had no home. There was a sort of glass wall between people who had a home and people who hadn't. He watched them pass and get into a little black car that was waiting to pick them up. 
He thought with a twinge of resentment that some people could still get petrol for cars, even in wartime. Black market. It would serve them right if the police caught them. Then the car moved off with a puff of blue smoke, and he felt even more lonely. The shadow of the cliff grew nearer and nearer. Please help, he said to the soft warm air and the dimming blue sky. Don't leave me. He felt the approach of another night alone as if it was a monster. The shadow of the cliff was only a metre away now. He reached out his arm and put his hand into it. It felt cold, like putting your hand into water, icy water. And yet still he hoped, as the shadow crept up his arm. He closed his eyes and felt the shadow creeping like the liquid in a thermometer. Only it wasn't recording heat, it was recording cold. And then he heard an explosive snort just in front of him, sat upright, startled, and opened his eyes. It was a dog, a dog sitting, watching him. A dog who had been in the sea because its black fur was all spikes. A dog who had been rolling in the sand because the spikes were all sandy. The dog watched him with what seemed to be very kind eyes. But then most dogs had kind eyes. The dog held its paw up to him, and hesitantly he took it. The dog woofed twice, softly, approvingly, then took its paw back. Was this his miracle? He looked round swiftly for an owner before he let himself hope. There was no one else on the beach, just him and the dog. But lots of dogs came down to the beach on their own and made friends with anybody for an afternoon. And there was a medal on the dog's collar. Not breathing, not daring to hope, he pulled the dog to him by the collar and read the medal. The dog was called Don and lived at 12 Aldergrove Terrace. Harry shut his eyes and he couldn't even have told himself whether he closed them in gladness or horror. Aldergrove Terrace had been a very posh and very short terrace. Three weeks ago, Aldergrove Terrace had been hit by a full stick of German bombs. Anybody in Aldergrove who was still alive was in hospital, permanently. He opened his eyes and looked at his fellow survivor. The dog was a sort of small, short-legged Alsatian. It looked quite fit, but rather thin and uncared for. It certainly hadn't been combed in a long time, and people had combed their dogs in Aldergrove every day. It had been that sort of place. He pulled the dog towards him again, almost roughly. It willingly collapsed against his leg and lay staring out to sea, its mouth open and its tongue gently out. He stroked it. The sandy fur was nearly dry and he could feel the warmth of its body seeping out damply against his leg. They stayed that way a long time, a long, contented time, just being together. Long ago they'd had a dog at number nine, but it had got old and died. It was good to have a dog again. And the way the dog delighted in his hand, he knew it was glad to have found somebody as well. He dreamily watched the little waves breaking on the sand, glad he wasn't alone anymore. And then the dog stood up and shook itself and whined, watching him with those warm eyes. It wanted something from him. What is it, boy? The sound of his own voice startled him. He hadn't spoke to anybody since he ran away from the wardens. What do you want, boy? The dog whined again and then nudged with its long nose at the bundle of blankets, sniffing. Then it turned and nosed at the attaché case, pushing it through the sand. The dog was hungry, and he had nothing to give it, nothing in the world. And suddenly he felt terribly hungry himself. It threw him into a panic of helplessness. It was getting dark as well, and he had nothing to eat, nowhere to sleep. He put his face in his hands and rocked with misery. And then he remembered his father's voice saying angrily, Don't flap around like a wet hen. Think, son, think. It was the boat he noticed first, the boat he had been leaning against. The owner had turned it upside down to stop the rain getting in like they always did, but that had been a long time ago. This boat hadn't been used for years. The black tarry paint was splitting, peeling, blistering. There was a half-inch crack where the stern met the side. That meant safety. A hiding place, a roof for the night if it started to rain. There was a gap on this side between the boat and the sand, only six inches, but he could make it bigger. He began to scrabble at the sand with his hands. The sand came easily, it was soft and dry. Soon he managed to wriggle through the hole he had made. Inside it was dark, apart from the cracks in the stern where some light came in. 
but it smelt sweetly of the sea and old tar and dry wood. The dog wriggled through to join him, licking his face, sure it was a game. He pushed it away and reached out and dragged in the bundle of blankets and the attaché case. There was plenty of room. It was a big boat, a fishing boat. He squatted by the entrance like an Indian in his wigwam. It solved one problem, and it gave him strength. Now, food. He racked his brains. Then he remembered there had always been a big fish and chip shop in Front Street. It wouldn't sell much fish now because the trawlers were away on convoy escort. But it still sold chips and sausages cooked in batter. All the fish and chip shops did. But money. He searched desperately through his pockets for odd pennies and halfpennies, and his fingers closed on the milled edge of a big fat two-shilling piece. Yesterday had been Thursday, and Dad had given him his week's pocket money as usual. It all seemed so very far away, but there was the big fat florin in his hand. He rubbed the edge in the dim light to make sure it was real, not just a penny. He took a deep breath and wormed out through the hall again, followed by the dog. He was in a hurry now. His stomach was sort of dissolving into juice at the thought of the battered sausages. He didn't like the idea of leaving his blankets and the precious attaché case behind, but he couldn't carry them and the chips as well. Besides, they would make him look conspicuous. They would have to take their chance, as Dad always said when he and Harry planted out tiny seedlings, watered them, and left them for the night. Harry shook his head savagely to shake away the memory and the sting of hot tears that prickled at his eyes suddenly. He smoothed back the sand to conceal the hole he had dug and set off for Front Street. The dog running ahead and marking the lamp posts as if this was an ordinary evening stroll along the seafront. Even a hundred meters away, the breeze carried the appetizing smell to his nostrils. The shop wasn't shut then. He felt full of triumph. There was a crowd of people in the shop, and they hadn't drawn the blackout curtains yet. He pushed open the door, and the dog nosed past him eagerly, nostrils working. The owner of the shop, a tall, bald man in a long, greasy white apron, looked over the heads of his customers and saw them. And Harry instantly knew he was a very nasty man indeed, even before he opened his mouth. Get that dirty great animal out of here! This is a clean shop, a food shop. Covered with confusion, blushing furiously, Harry grabbed the dog's collar and dragged him out. He pushed the dog's bottom to the pavement and shouted, "Sit, sit!" The dog looked at him trustingly, wagging his tail, and Harry dived back into the shop again before the dog changed his mind. He joined the back of the queue, which was about six people long. "Filthy great beast!" said the man to no one in particular. I don't know what this town's coming to. He shoveled great mounds of golden chips into newspaper and said to the woman helping him, "More batter, Ada." Equally nastily. Harry heard the shop door open again, and the next second Don was beside him, leaping up at the glass counter with eager paws and leaving dirty scratch marks on the glass. I told you, get that bloody animal out of here! I won't tell you again. Harry grabbed Don a second time. He could feel tears starting to gather in his eyes. He hauled him out as two more people passed him to join the queue inside. He'd lost his place in the queue, and every time somebody else came in, Don would come in with them, and he'd always lose his place in the queue and never get served. He looked round desperately. There was a lamp post with two sandbags attached for use against incendiary bombs. They were tied to the lamp post with thick string. Harry hauled Don over and undid the string and slipped it through Don's collar, tied a knot, and fled back into the shop. Messing with our sandbags now," said the man savagely. He seemed to have eyes everywhere but on his own business. "Don't live round here, dear." Harry's heart sank. Not living round here was important. He mightn't get served at all now. Shopkeepers looked after their own these days of rationing. It's a while since your face saw soap and water. Oh, you had a comb. Where are you from, the ridges? The ridges was the slummiest council estate in the whole town. It was a downright insult to anyone who came from Bulkwell. No, from Bulkwell," he said stoutly. "Well, you get back to Bulkwell chip shop, Sonny Jim. We've only got enough chips for time out people in this shop. And take that damn dog with you. Stolen him, have you? He looks a bit too grand for the likes of you. Have a good mind to phone for the police." The tears were streaming down Harry's face by that time. One of the women in the queue said, "Steady on, Jim. The pain's upset. You know what's the matter, son?" Something gave way inside Harry. It was all too much. He said, 
I've been bombed out. He heard a murmur of sympathy from the assembled customers, so he added, Me dad was killed. He said it like he was hitting the man with a big hammer. There was a terrible hush in the shop. Everyone looking at him, pale and open-mouthed. Then the woman said, Serve him first, Jim. You can have my turn. What do you want, son? Harry had only meant to have one portion to share with the dog, but the wild triumph was too sweet. The dog would have his own, and they'd have one each for breakfast in the morning too. And he was thirsty. Four sausage and chips and a bottle of taser. Viciously, the man scooped up the portions. Harry thought he'd tried to make them mingy portions, but all the customers were watching him, so he suddenly doubled up the number of chips, far more than he should have given. Then he banged the big newspaper parcel on the counter and the bottle of Tizer with it. Two shillings and fourpence. Harry gazed in horror at the two-shilling piece in his hand. He'd overreached himself with a vengeance, and he hadn't another penny on him. He stared around, panic-stricken at the staring faces. Then the woman took his two shillings off him, added fourpence of her own, and gave it to the man, saying, Run along, son. Your mam could do with them chips while they're hot. Ta, he said, staring at her plump, kindly face in wonder. Then he was out of the shop with the burning packet of chips against his chest and the tizer bottle on the pavement as he untied Don. He walked back to the boat in a whirl. So much had happened so quickly. But he'd gone to get chips, and he'd done it. Made a terrible mess of mistakes, but he'd done it. He spread the dog's share on the sand, on its newspaper, so that the dog wouldn't eat any sand by mistake. The dog wolfed the sausage first, then all the chips, and nosed the folds of paper for every last crumb of batter. Then came to scrounge off Harry. It must have been really starving. Well, now it was full, and he himself had seen to that. He felt obscurely proud. The dog was his, and he'd fed it, and found it a place to sleep. He stretched his legs out and lay against the boat, relaxed and swigged his tizer. He couldn't give the dog any tizer. He hadn't a bowl. But the dog loped off to where a little freshwater stream trickled down the sand from the castle cliff and lapped noisily. Another problem solved. He watched the little waves coming into the beach from the darkening river. Little lines of whiteness coming out of the dark. This time last night they'd all been sitting down to supper. Ma'am, Dad, Dulcie. He let himself cry then. Somehow he could afford to, with his belly full and his new home against his back, and his new friend the dog snuffling at his raincoat, still looking for crumbs of batter. He cried quite a long time, but he cried very quietly, not wanting anyone to hear him, in case they came across to find out what was the matter. The dog licked his tears with a huge wet tongue, and he hugged it to him. And yet, even as he was crying, he was thinking, hard. So many things going round in his mind like a squirrel in a cage... He must keep himself clean and tidy somehow. A dirty face got you into trouble. He must comb his hair. He must keep his shoes polished and his raincoat clean. And he must get a leash for Don. And he must stay near fresh water to drink. And he reached for Don's collar in the dark, twisted off the medal and threw it as far down the beach as he could. That medal was Don's death sentence. The police caught dogs who'd lost their owners in air raids and had them put down on an electrified plate at the police station. They dampened the dog's coat, then they electrocuted it. That was what Dad had said had happened to their old dog when he got too old. He said they did it to some lovely dogs, it was a shame. Don was his dog now. As the last tinge of light faded far out over the sea, he dug under the boat again, crawled in and called the dog in after him. It wouldn't do to be on the beach after dark. People might ask questions. He spread the blankets neatly, wishing he had a candle to see by. That was something else he'd have to lay his hands on. He had the sand hole neatly filled in again when his need to pee caught him in the groin like a knife. Swearing to himself, he dug the hole again and got outside only just in time. He crawled back, thinking he had an awful lot to learn. He'd always had ma'am until now, saying do this, do that, till he could scream. Now he had to say do this, do that to himself. Still, he was snug. He had enough blankets to make two into a pillow and give one to the dog, except the dog snuggled up close to him and he let it in. He gave one deep sigh and was asleep. All night his breathing lay hidden under the greater breathing of the sea. He wakened once to hear rain patting on the boat, but it only made things cosier. 
End of side one.